Uh, we're very lucky to have an excellent panel of people who've thought a lot about these issues and been involved in them over many, many years in different capacities. Um, first up is uh, Daryl uh, Mullendorf, is that how you say yeah. it? Yeah. Um, from um, Goethe University in Frankfurt. Who's gonna, we're gonna, I've said to the speakers 10 minutes each, and I know there might be a little bit of spillage um, from uh, one, one to the next, but let's try and take them in turn, unless there's any quick points of clarification at the end of each intervention. Uh, but let's try and protect as much time for discussion afterwards. So, Daryl. Okay, so this is a sprint, and I have to leave out all the jokes, I guess. <laughs> is, that right? um, is, is it okay for the sound if I stand? Or is it, do uh, I need to be sitting? Microphone on you. Uh, uh, that'll take time. So let me, just, let, me, uh, let me just do it yeah. this way. Um, all right, so I take it that what you're interested in is sort of conjunctural um, justice issues and not timeless justice issues. Um, being a philosopher, I might be tempted to talk about the latter, but I'll talk about the sort of conjunctural stuff with respect specifically to the, um, the, the latest treaty. Um, so here we go. There are four issues. There's no way I'm going to get through all four of these, I realize, if I have 10 minutes. So uh, maybe I'll focus on one. Maybe I'll try to focus on one, three, and one, two, and four. Um, uh, we're well prepped for the first one from the last talk, and I'm very appreciative uh, uh, of that, in fact, because I was feeling nervous about talking about this. But I think it's important. So. Um, the first thing to uh, notice is that the, um, the treaty leaves open the possibility of adopting the target of 1.5 degrees. And most people that I speak to think that this is a terrific idea, um, and I'm not so sure it's a terrific idea. I don't, I'm not firmly opposed to it, but I'm not so sure it's a terrific idea to leave open the possibility of setting the target for 1.5 degrees. So let me just say why I have certain doubts of, about that. Uh, there we go. So I mean, part of what part of what we need to think about. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know what the the formatting is there. Part of what we need to think about is a sort of moral weighing, right? Weighing of uh, the 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 sort of reasons to to mitigate or reasons that are that have to do with the, the concerns of future generations and the, the likely consequences of warming and the possible catastrophic consequences of warming. And that sort of that that necessarily kind of pushes our our interest towards wanting to adopt a lower temperature target. But we also need to be aware that there are interests of people living now, particularly the very poor, who are going to be affected by a mitigation regime. And um, they're going to be affected possibly in a number of important ways. The most obvious way is that the possibility of increasing the absolute cost of energy um, as we mitigate. And of course, the more, um, the more we uh, try to adopt a very sort of ambitious mitigation target, the more worry there might be about that. There's also other associated costs, like the possible increase in food costs if we transform economies towards biofuels. And then, you know, some people think that if you really want to hit a very strong mitigation target, what you're going to need to do is enter into a period of degrowth in the industrialized world. I, I think that's a very controversial claim, but it's some people's claim. And of course, if that were to happen, it would have ripple effects to the developing economy. We know this from the recent, uh, the recent experience of the Great Recession, that when you enter into the sort of recessionary and degrowth periods in the, um, in the developed world, that these have catastrophic or devastating effects on the economies of the, develop, of the developing world. So there's reasons to worry, I think. I, I wasn't surprised when, and I, I only know this from the newspapers, but I wasn't surprised when I read about the um, about the, uh, the conference that India raised some concerns about the 1.5 degree um, target. And it seems to me that they rightly raised those concerns. There's, I think there should be real worry that in pursuing the 1.5 degree target, we may find ourselves in a position that we might, um, might be doing something uh, quite harmful to the developing world. My research, I should say, sort of parenthetically, has been not entirely, maybe mostly, at least a, a major theme of my research over the years has been um, the, the importance of the right to sustainable development in, in the climate change mitigation um, um, regime. And I think that from that perspective, if you take that to be um, a serious concern, there's some reason to worry that the 1.5 degree um, goal might be, um, might be too much. Uh, there's other reasons, I think, to think about uh, uh, the, the, the difficulties with respect to that goal. So where I come from, in Frankfurt, you have to quote Kant. And one of the things that Kant said is, he who wills the ends wills the means. Right? And so what, what would be the means that would be required to hit a 1.5 degree goal? I mean, it's a, it's a difficult question, right? It's a difficult question because we know it's going to be very hard to hit a 2 degree goal. We know this because um, 
the, uh, according to at least the latest AR5 report, that the vast majority of the scenarios that get us to two degrees require a technology that we don't really have. It's not scalable yet. If we begin to think that it's going to be that hard to hit a two degree goal, then presumably it's going to be even harder to hit a, a, a 1.5 degree goal. And are we committed to using that technology in any case? I mean, do we think that, um, that we, should, uh, we should pursue the 1.5 degree goal um, if it requires using that technology, given that there are risks associated with the te technology, assuming that we could actually um, scale the technology? Or would we, we, would we be willing to use solar radiation management to hit the two degree or the 1.5 degree goal? It's an interesting question, and I think that it's, um, it's a question that I would want to put on the table. It's a question that I think that we should consider. There are interesting proposals with respect to the use of solar radiation management. The most interesting, I think, is the one by David Keith, who has this idea that we would, um, we would ratchet down the use of solar radiation management as we increase our mitigation ambition, and in the end, we would be relying entirely on mitigation and not at all on solar radiation management. But the thought is that that would, be a that would be a means that might allow us to hit a more, um, uh, a more ambitious goal. Do we want to use means like that if it's required to hit the goal? It seems to me these sorts of things need to be uh, considered. Finally, I guess I just worry about sort of good faith here. I mean, what, what does it really mean to adopt a 1.5 degree goal when the pledges as we have them aren't even sufficient to hit the 2 degree goal? So, I mean, I, I worry that there's a kind, of, a kind of window dressing that's occurring here, that it's pleasing a bunch of people, but in fact, there's very little, um, there's very little likelihood that it, would ever be, um, that it would ever be achieved. So I don't mean to argue here that I'm against the 1.5 degree go uh, goal, but I do think that there are significant worries with respect to the goal, and it's worth taking into consideration. I guess I'd like to dampen the enthusiasm a little bit about the inclusion of the goal in the document. Five minutes. Okay. I've used five minutes or I have five minutes? If you use five, you've got five. five. <laughs> 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 right, great. Okay. Um, so can, uh, can this, another important concern of justice is whether mitigation ambition can be increased. Obviously, the, um, the document, the treaty, wants to see that happen. Um, and of course, this sort of depends in, in significant part on what you think is preventing um, mitigation ambition from being stronger. And if you think it has to do with collective action problems, um, the standard collective action problem sort of in economics and in international relations is the tragedy of commons problem. And the idea there is that for any given state, it's no matter what other states do, it's rational not to mitigate. And it's rational not to mitigate because of the short to medium term costs. But there's another uh, collective action problem that has more prominence in the philosophy literature. Um, and Stephen Gardner is the one who sort of made us aware of the possibility of this, and it's the intergenerational problem. And the thought there is that because of these short-term costs for any particular generation, um, and, and the fact that the benefits are only going to accrue over the long term, that for any particular generation it's rational not to mitigate. So if in fact we're in the throes of one or the other of these collective action problems, it looks like it's going to be very difficult to increase mitigation ambition, right? I mean, solving either one of these problems is going to be a long-term process. It's not going to be something that's going to be done in the next 10 years, presumably. Um, or, I mean, the, the people who, who have sort of the best recommendations for solving the first kind of tragedy of commons problem talk about the club approach to climate change mitigation. And usually they refer to the process of the World Trade Organization as sort of the development of that as their model. And of course, that took 40 years to get a successful organization. The solving of the intergenerational problem is much harder. It's much harder because it's hard to even imagine what the framework might be that would change the payoffs in the appropriate way. Um, this is where what Fergus had to say yesterday is so incredibly important, I think. Um, and it matters, of course, whether or not it's true, but we should all want what Fergus said yesterday to be true, right? I and mean, we should all want that. I don't know whether it's true or not, but we should really want um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the change in costs of mitigation plus the benefits of mitigation to, to be such that there aren't these short-term um, the short costs associated with mitigation. That would be very good news for mitigation. It would mean that there could be net benefits for uh, mitigation, that these could be Caldor Hicks improvements. Um, that would be terrific news. Um, the bad news, of course, is that even if there were net benefits, um, that's probably not enough to solve the the collective action problems, whether it's the tragedy of commons problem or whether it's the intergenerational problem, because what matters in solving these problems, as it turns out, is not the facts of the costs. 
It's people's beliefs about the facts. When it comes to rational action, it's what people believe about the world that's important, but not what the nature of the world itself is. So even if it were the case um, that there were net benefits to mitigation, there's still the possibility of disinformation campaigns that could prevent us from moving in the right direction, that our beliefs might not align up with the facts because of these different disinformation campaigns. And as Fergus himself noted, there's still the possibility that they're going to be losers in particular cases. Um, when you have net benefits, when you have Keller Hicks improvements, there can still be particular losers, and these can be very powerful political actors. So if Fergus and the people around him um, at the LSE are right, then I think it changes the political, um, it changes the political landscape, and the, the move should be towards looking at national politics and trying to, um, trying to get the bad actors um, in line through political movements or through political policies. Essentially, I think the same issue uh, occurs with respect to compliance. You're going to have the same problems with respect to um, the, um, the, the collective action problems. Let me just say something quickly about the right to sustainable development because it's dear to my heart. I was very pleased to see that it's uh, in the document. Um, and um, there was some discussion yesterday um, and, uh, about, the, about the change in the nature of the treaty that is a that it's a treaty that, um, instead of being a top-down treaty, is now uh, a treaty that moves from the bottom up, and there's the absence of the firewall, um, the firewall that, uh, that um, assigned uh, the status of, of some countries to a particular annex that wouldn't be assigned any obligations in a mitigation regime, and there was worry about that, or some people expressed uh, possible worry about that. I think that that worry is overstated, actually. I think that one of the interesting things about the pledge and review process is that it offers a kind of procedural safeguard um, for the substantive principle of justice, namely the right to sustainable development. Since states don't adopt mitigation goals as a result of diplomatic wrangling amongst each other, the opportunity for powerful states to coerce less powerful states into, a, into adopting a mitigation goal that would be contrary to their development interests is less. And I think that's an important benefit of the Pledge and Review approach, and it's one that perhaps we don't pay enough attention to and we don't um, recognize as, as being what it is as a benefit. But there are still problems, I think, with respect to um, the, um, the right to sustainable development. There are still threats within this document, even if one kind of important threat is gone. There are others. The overall mitigation effort might be too weak. That would certainly pose a threat to the development aims of, of countries. There's worries that the, um, that the efforts to try to fund an international fund that would help the, international, the, the sustainable de development efforts of countries is, um, is insufficient. And I think there's real worries about whether or not there's going to be the kind of technology transfer that's called for within the, within the document, whether we actually whether the document actually um, institutes the appropriate means to doing that. All of these, I think, are important for the development ambitions of countries, and um, there are ways in which, if you take seriously the right to sustainable development, there's, um, there's plenty of room for further work. And I don't know how I did. Three seconds. Three seconds. 30. 30 seconds. I'm just stopping. That's just going to be a benefit. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next, next up is uh, Sam uh, Bickersteth, who's the CEO from the Climate Development Knowledge Network. Um, it's played a key part in a lot of these debates. Sam, I think you're starting with a short video, or are you going to use the video? In, in, just in a second, yeah. Do okay. I need to be near the microphone? How yes, near the microphone is it? Okay. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah, good morning, and fantastic to be here. I think this would be a practitioner's, um, a practitioner's uh, perspective um, more than uh, a theoretical framework, and I think hopefully you can draw on this. I'd like to talk, I'd like, I wanted to talk about three things, which is about climate impacts and the costs of impacts, and it's really hopefully playing to, 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 to Yuba's development first perspective, and I'll show you a short film from some work we've been doing in Uganda, and talk a little about in, the integration of INDCs into development processes. I was going to talk about climate diplomacy as well, and let me just say two things about that. There was a triumph of climate <coughs> justice played out in the climate diplomacy in Paris. Um, with the small island states in particular winning the 1.5, whatever um, the, the technical challenges are, uh, and that was, uh, wasn't a simple thing. The emergence of the high, um, um, high um, ambition coalition in Paris, where the Marshall and Islands uh, and Gambia and others played a very significant role, was played out climate diplomacy, and it was planned and worked through. And it's very important to understand there was a justice dimension that came through in that process. Uh, but I won't dwell on that. There's a paper 
Britain before Paris over there, which people might want to take away. So why don't we just watch a four-minute film from Uganda? Thank you, that's it. Uganda. Its economy is growing and people's lives are improving, but this progress is already impacted by the effects of climate change. In Uganda's capital, Kampala, flooding has increased, adding pressures to a city which is already struggling from a growing population. Kampala is made up of hills and valleys. Most of the settlements have gone up slope. So whenever it rains, there is a lot of water that is coming from these rooftops. Wetland areas are the main drainage uh, systems for this city. Unfortunately, they have been blocked by developments. Those flooding zones are the arteries to other parts of the country. And therefore, when it floods, the counter comes to sunstein. But there are measures that the city's planners can take that will benefit Uganda's people, even if the climate stabilizes. It will require investment to make the city's whole infrastructure more resilient. The Baduda area of Mount Elgon is home to many coffee growers. <laughs> Given that uh, the temperatures have changed, then increasingly the land area suitable for Arabic coffee growing is shifting, are generally going up. It's going to increase on the effects of climate change because a lot of uh, trees are going to be destroyed in favor of settlements. Landslides regularly wreak devastation across the Baduda district, leaving death and chaos in their wake. So what can be done to stem the damage created by these weather extremes? We are encouraging farmers to practice climate smart agriculture. We make trenches and we have planted trees. We keep the temperatures cooler or lower. We protect the soils from heavy rains. In the west of Uganda, one of the country's major rivers is also under pressure from climate change. Over two million people rely on the Vampanga <coughs> and they use for different uh, Sudden heavy rains wash silt into the water in the towns, making it undrinkable. In other areas, decreasing rainfall means that the river level is dropping. The Impanga River is also vital for generating electricity. Not having adequate water, this power station is operating under capacity. When it comes to dry spell, they are worse than they used to be. There is a pressing need to balance these conflicting demands on the river. The loss in energy has extremely high economic costs. Already the demand for energy is higher than the supply. The projections are that it's going to increase. Climate change continues to be the most defining problem of the country of Uganda. The cost of inaction is 20 times greater than the cost of adaptation. You're making people more resilient, you have more production, more income, and better welfare. It's a huge cost if we don't act right away. I think that's it. So um, thank you very much. I and mean, hopefully that, from the words of the Ugandans, much better spoken for me about the cost of, action, of, of inaction being considerably um, greater. 20 times more is what this study showed. But the, the current costs of, of climate change on Uganda's economy uh, are drawn out in this study, 5% of overseas development assistance, um, uh, and that will set the sector grow to 3 or 4% of GDP in the next 30 years. The point is, is self-evidently made by these numbers that this is a development problem. Uh, and it's worth, in a way, despite what you said, you, but the, the framing of the Paris Agreement is around future economic pathways. It's not about climate change. It gets lost in mitigation, it's true, and adaptation goals and things. But the starting point is around economic development and, and food security is actually mentioned in, 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 in Article 2.1. Um, so, so bringing this into and keeping it into the development challenge is, is, is the, the point going forward. So INDCs, in many respects, was the bottom-up response uh, to the, the, the run-in to Paris that came um, originally from Cancun, I believe, um, and was an unexpected success. Um, 
and the challenge is for the INDC is not to be seen as something that belongs to my friend Mr. Chebet in the Ministry of Water and Climate Change, but belongs to the whole development, to the Ministry of Planning uh, and the Finance of, of um, Uganda as well. And the purpose of the study which we supported, which this film articulates, was to take a good number to the Ministry of Finance, that 20% that twenty times cost uh, of, 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 of more of inaction, or the 3 or 4% of GDP. Those were the numbers that would shift the development debate, enable that ministry uh, to, to, to shift the politics of acting on climate change, and that was what the minister uh, wanted there. So we know that climate change is a multiplier of the development deficit. It's another way of, of saying exactly what you have said but it's very articulately before, before. We know that climate change runs through the SDGs. Seven of the SDGs actually have climate targets. 14 of the 17 really are very closely linked to climate change. It's wo woven through, and it is a better framework uh, to look at this than the Paris Agreement itself. I would, would completely concur with, with, with what you have said. So if you take the INDCs, um, what happens to them? There's a great, and I'm sure you talked a lot about this yesterday, there's a great flurry of excitement about INDC implementation. Maybe it should be about integration rather than implementation. Integration into economic uh, sectors. Because they have locked in uh, all parties, uh, basically, um, uh, you know, despite different um, CBDR and French circumstances, Article 4 talks about progression on the INDCs, so it's going to be quite difficult for countries to, to not deliver against them. And they returned, indeed, that the, the Ugandans you know, went home and said, crikey, we have to deliver a report in three years' time on INDC, how are we going to do that? So in a way, they fell straight back into the trap of this is a climate change problem and how are we going to measure it? So data is a, is a very big issue, um, uh, and the implementation, using that, of the agreements. Vague targets, the robustness of the baselines. So, what, I mean, I think nearly all parties, 190 parties delivered before or shortly afterwards uh, their INDCs. And of course they weren't, they were, well, they were far from perfect, many of them. Some have been through a big consultative process. Um, the one we worked on in Peru was based on three years of substantial work around mitigation pathways with clearly articulated mitigation actions, uh, which the government, the government was prioritizing and put in 11 priority actions in its INDC. Um, others were sort of done by a couple of modelers in, in the back of, back of an office somewhere without talking to anybody and quickly endorsed by heads of state. Others will go into national law. I mean, in, in Peru, it's about the, this, the same process will go back into national legislation uh, and the climate change bill on the president's desk in, in Kenya also is one where, um, one where uh, there's an endorsement of, that, of the INDC process. But for developing countries, land use, I mean mitigation was going to come through really energy and land use, and land use is the biggest sector in most of these economies, and measurement is particularly <coughs> difficult. The Bangladesh INDC um, completely missed out the AFALU, the land use uh, uh, sector, because the data wasn't there. So you kind of say, well, what's the value of this process if it isn't integrated into the sectors? And that's going to be a major challenge um, for, um, for reporting um, on GHG emissions um, in, in the future of the process. Um, so um, it then links to the issue of finance. So I think this finance, of course, was a key issue that was the sort of the word that, that brought justice, as it were, into the negotiations. Um, and of course you will all know that the concept of $100 billion uh, as the floor was built into the agreement, but, um, uh, and many, most of the developing country INDCs were conditional uh, on that finance, so there's conditional and unconditional levels. Um, a whole range of countries had a sort of 10% increment if they'll deliver 10% um, uh, more, so um, Bangladesh, I think even, even Colombia's, I think, was 20% was uh, uh, unconditional and 30% conditional. Bangladesh's, I think, was 5% unconditional, which was quite a good offer from Bangladesh, but 15% reductions against baseline, as usual, uh, with, with, with finance. So there's a sort of vagueness about the finance, which is very worrying. Um, and, of course, the 100 billion is insignificant. It's about trillions, not billions. Um, the Green Climate Fund, around which there's been a lot of attention with its 10 billion 
uh, in its coffers to, to disperse and struggling how to do that um, uh, is, is a starting point and it clearly needs to be seen as a catalyst for much, much larger flows of capital. So, you know, of course there was this other story in Paris, which, uh, there were several other stories in Paris which were, which were nowhere near Le Bourget and another, one of the big stories was around business uh, and, and capital shifting and the role that Mark Carney and others played in, in, in signalling to corporates that shift. And I saw some of that played out, and it, it's quite encouraging. Uh, but it's still very, very early days uh, in, in that sense. Um, so the INDCs are far from perfect. In the context of countries, it's not just finance, though. It's around knowledge um, uh, and capacity. Um, I think the previous speaker also referred to the issue of legitimacy. So who, who does this belong to? Who's actually made this deal? How much does society b b belong? You can drive this through to a legal, uh, to a parliamentary process or a law, but is it, is it owned by the different sectors of society that Uber ha has, has mentioned? So there will be this huge capacity need uh, for delivering the INDCs, not only um, the first phase, which will only deliver you know, according to the calculation of, uh, about a target of three degrees, but ratcheting them up over the subsequent cycles. So there's the current and the subsequent cycles through uh, the following five-year periods through to 2030. And that's a really big task because the INDCs have basically done the easy, low-hanging fruits, uh, and it will be these harder <coughs> targets to achieve in energy, in land use I've already referred to, uh, and other sectors in urban development and so on, which this will have to happen. So, the, so, so, so capacity needs are, are really, really large. It's not going to happen unless this is brought and kept in the development framework, as, as Uber has, has emphasized so strongly in his work over the years. Um, and the principle of co-benefits um, and putting mitigation and adaptation at the heart of that uh, is, is going to be critical. I mean, I hope that this film from Uganda, and I have some copies of the film and sticks there if you want to see a longer version, emphasizes that in a way because this is built into, this is integrated in, into urban development, this is integrated in water management, this is integrated into coffee production here and now, it shouldn't be very difficult actually. Um, and the challenge post Paris is not to be returning to Bonn to talk to UNFCCC, it's, it's talking to development agents, whether they're private investors, development agencies, or the ministries of finance and planning. Um, so I think with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks for sticking to time. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Any, any very quick questions or clarifications for Sam? Not big questions, but yeah, clarifications. If not, we'll, we'll move swiftly on to Sonia. Uh, so Sonia Klinsky, who's uh, from the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University. Sonia. Thank you. So it's always tricky um, on a last day like this because you're trying to pull all the thoughts together from everyone and not overlap terribly with all the people who just went before you and try to expand the ideas so we can have a discussion. So I'm going to skip over some things and talk about other things that just simply haven't entered our discussion. Not necessarily because I think those are the most important, but because my main goal here is to make sure that as a group we've seen the full expanse of conversations here. So what I was first... I uh, asked if I would contribute to this panel, I immediately thought back to this conversation I had with a leading American NGO uh, representative at one of the American briefings in Paris, and he and I had a dispute a couple years ago, because I had said, you know, equity is going to be crucial to the Paris Agreement, we've got to think about this, and we were leaving the American briefing, and he said, see, differentiation has solved equity, we've solved equity, equity is no longer part of the climate conversation, and I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I, that, um, no. <laughs> and so it made me think a lot about how to articulate the issues to a broad range of people. And as someone who's living in a very conservative part of America, it's also forced me to think differently about how do we make sure that these conversations are not focused purely on what is equity in developing countries, but how do we make this relevant to those people in some of the more developed countries who are also going to have to see massive change if we're going to get anywhere close to the kind of targets we need to get at. So I'm going to bring this into the conversation a little bit too because we haven't talked a lot about that here. So we've seen this all. This is from Climate Tracker. This is simply reminding us, A, we have INDCs. Even if we achieved them, which is unlikely unless out massive action in all countries, 
we wouldn't hit either 1.5 or 2. And the point I want to stress here is the implementation. This is picking up quite nicely on the themes we've already heard. It's one thing to have these on paper. It's another to figure out how we're going to do them, much less increase them. And this is an, a kind of a call for the political theorists and academics in the room to think hard about justice in implementation. So this isn't just an issue for practitioners. There's a call here for academics, for political theorists to take the question of implementation really seriously. And there's three core issues, with, even if we stay within the narrow bounds of UNFCCC, and I agree with Yuba here that this should go beyond the UNFCCC, but even if we just narrow ourselves, the finance capacity and technology issues are just monumental. And it's an area where we see a lot of work from practitioners and not as much work from a more theoretical perspective in the academy, from thinking really hard about how to integrate equity into every single one of these, or a justice approach. So, what would a justice approach to technology look like in all countries? What would it look like to capacity building? Where's the role of universities to do this? There's a lot of questions about how we actually support the implementation of climate development actions on the ground, what transparency across these looks like. So we talked a lot yesterday about transparency and the potential role of civil society to work on the transparency and ratchet mechanisms. Well, what does that look like in capacity building? If we say we have to take equity or justice seriously across all of these and the capacity building has to be ratcheted up, well, what does that look like? What are we being transparent about? Are we looking at the kinds of supports offered by developing countries? Are we looking at how they're doing it domestically? Are, they, are we looking at the kinds of education that's happening in all countries? How, what do we even do there? And then the other element, what does an aggressive country-driven implementation look like and what are the points of support? And I'm going to add barriers here. So another area, for those of you who know me, one of the things I've been really concerned about is not just justice from a principle approach, but the idea of the social psychology of justice. So we know that there are going to be particularly pointed communities who are going to be losers. And this, this speaks back to someone's <coughs> point, maybe Daryl's, maybe someone else's, about thinking about where those points of massive change are. So these are things like, thinking in a developed country context, coal miners, um, communities which are facing particularly heavy changes. If we don't take their perceptions of justice seriously, they're going to be political blockages. And so we have to think about this both from moral and politically strategic reasons. And we've been speaking here a lot about the moral component. But we also have to think about who's blocking different kinds of actions and why. And perceptions of injustice are really important here. And until we get our head around why and how that's happening, and if there are other solutions that are able to meet people's fundamental desires here, we're going to get stuck. So the other, we've already, this, this taps into a lot of conversations we heard yesterday in different ways, so I'm thinking hard about how do you do a ambitious climate action in ways that absolutely avoid reducing human rights. So this picks up on something that Tara talked about. So when you look at the kinds of implementation we're going to need in both developed and developing countries, there are often negative side effects. So I'm thinking here about the informal transportation sector, who are often the poorest of the poor who are working on informal transportation, who get displaced by new green transportation plans. You have to think about those kinds of trade-offs in the development of these kinds of plans. And again, this works in both developed and developing country contexts. You need to think about this in the implementation, and there's work here for both the practitioner community and the more theoretical academic community. Another one is that that we've seen market mechanisms. There's a whole section in uh, the COP discussion or in the agreement about the potential for market mechanisms, although they're not called that, and not only those countries which wish to do so. There's lots of interesting framing around it. But market mechanisms are likely to be a major part of the post-Paris conversation, both domestically and internationally. So again, in the developed countries, we've seen huge public pushback around issues of perceived fairness around pricing. And those pricing we've seen are a drop in the bucket compared to the kind of pricing we'd be looking at if we were serious about moving to the kinds of targets we need in developed countries. So we need to think hard about equity and pricing both in developed countries and in developing countries, and that includes things like CDM-like mechanisms which have an explicit international component. We know there's been justice elements in the past. What can we learn? There's a role here for academics, especially as we move towards the IPCC's sixth assessment, and I'm really hoping that the third working group will have a solid section on means of implementation with an equity focus. 
really trying to look across all the kinds of lessons we've learned from an equity focus across implementation. I think this is the kind of information that would be really valuable to both practitioners and academics. And then we have this conversation about benefits. So I am also in the camp of uh, Fergus, who's saying we need to think about benefits, but I'm also in the I really hope it's true camp, that there really are climate action benefits. But again, because I'm coming at this from a very strong equity or justice perspective, how do we ensure that any benefits are proactively directed to those who have the least or who are least well off? So there's double whammy here. It isn't just enough to say there's a narrative of climate action benefits. The question is, how do we deal with the distribution of benefits? And there's been very little conversation about the distribution of benefits specifically targeted to those who are least well off. And again, there's space here from a theoretical perspective, and there's also a space here from, an, from a practitioner perspective. Now, because we have a very short amount of time, I have no, do I have maybe five minutes left? Four minutes uh, left? No, I have seven minutes left. Woo! Look at that. I feel rich. Um, <laughs> I wanted to put another idea on the board entirely, um, so I'm going to change from the implementation conversation. And I want to return to a conversation we had yesterday where implicitly we kept talking about strategies for increasing justice or making justice a bigger part of the conversation. And the classic has been the burden sharing analysis, which comes, feeds directly into the kind of naming and shaming strategy. So this is climate action tracker, this is the transparency, idea behind transparency, and really trying to show people, this is what you've committed, this is what you've said, this is where you've fallen short, and that's a really powerful strategy. But the other strategy we've also talked about is the benefits of climate action narrative, right? So this can be a pro-development climate action narrative, it ties into the low-carbon climate development uh, narrative, and the idea here is we can have a more aspirational goals, and we can get somewhere different by having aspirational goals. This is another really powerful strategy, and it's being used all the time. Another one which we've touched on off and on through the last couple of days, but no one's really delved into in depth, is the legal means. So we know that there's a lot of tension around this. The fact that the United States and other developed countries explicitly tried to limit liability in the agreement shows to me the level of fear here about the potential of full legal liability options. There's been a ton of legal research looking at liability for corporations, <coughs> domestic liability. This is another narrative about a strategy. How, do one, how does one get justice? And so I've been thinking about these strategies and saying, okay, these are, you know, are there alternatives? Are there ways of integrating them? Are these really all the only strategies we have and what else might there be? So in the last year, I've been thinking about looking towards other areas and other regimes which have had to deal with deep historical justice and the challenge of moving forward. And one of these is transitional justice. Now that may sound like a crazy idea, but my fundamental argument is that climate change is absolutely not the only time that humans have had to deal with profoundly difficult, historically rooted injustices in combination with forward-oriented needs for solidarity and collective action. This actually is not the only unique in the climate, in, in the human existence. This has happened all over the world. For instance, the last one of the largest databases of transitional justice looks at over 800 mechanisms globally where people have tried to deal with a backward-looking justice component with the recognition that that throws long shadows over any kind of future <coughs> agreements. So my question has been, can we learn from this? Is there, are there any lessons we could learn from all these human experiences? And this is a project that I've been working on, and they're kind of interesting. So they typically employ multiple strategies, so I'll go back to my strategy slide. It's not about any one of these. It's about how do you use them in concert to create an, a different kind of momentum. So there's an integration component, and there's ideas about both the concerns of justice from a principled perspective and also inevitable recognition of the messiness of political processes. So it's not just enough to have pure justice principles. You have to deal with the embedded interests and the sheer messiness of politics and disputes. So why do I think that these areas have any relevance at all? Well, there's some structural similarities. There's interdependence, right? Just like in a country that is facing the potential of a civil war if it doesn't resolve some of these tensions, we can't just walk away from the earth. We are forced into being neighbors. So one of the key arguments against this would say, well, these are only useful in individual countries. Well, the climate issue, in some essence, makes us an individual country because none of us can just walk away and say it's not relevant to us. We have a forced interdependence here. And the hurting stalemates is that you have some extent 
we absolutely have to have some solidarity and collective action here. We can't get around it. The limited ability of the judiciary. Again, in deep disputes, the judicial system has limits, either because of institutional limits, it doesn't fit the kinds of issues. So we have legal crimes and moral issues, right? And moral and legal don't always overlap perfectly. And I think climate is one of those situations where our legal system may not be able to deal with the full depth of the moral issues faced in the justice here. And so we may need to look more broadly at other kinds of models for dealing with these kinds of harms. Profound disagreement about the ideal relationship between the past and the future in a period of transition. So this has been a key component of the historical <coughs> responsibility debate in climate change. This ultimate question about how much should past emissions, past culpability shape future actions, right? This is the heart of the historical responsibility debates. And this is exactly why transitional justice has been so difficult and why these have been agreed in other kinds of contexts. We have to come to some discussion here about this. And the deal of profound loss. So again, we've touched about loss and damage off and on throughout this whole, uh, whole agreement, whole conference, but what does it really mean to think about how you address profound loss? You can deal with some compensation, but frankly, monetary compensation is not gonna do me any good if I've just lost my livelihood, my home, my culture, all my social connections. Some money, it might help, but it's not really gonna deal with profound loss. And transitional justice also has had to grapple with this. Whole communities have been changed inalterably, and it's had to come up with different kinds of ways <coughs> of dealing with this, different kinds of reparations that aren't just legal and or financial compensation. So the reason I'm suggesting we think about this a little bit more is the idea that Im even very imperfect analogies are useful because they open our minds to new possibilities. So what kind of structural or systemic change would fundamentally change the justice dimensions? And this includes thinking about the kind of benefit and opportunity structures we have. What kinds of uh, means of acknowledging moral and not only legal harms are possible? And what would that look like in a legal agreement? What options for managing responsibility are there between a full liability and a full amnesty? And what would that look like in the climate space? And what kinds of processes are, have been developed to recognize the multi-scalar dimension of injustices in the past? And again, this is something transitional justice has had to deal with a lot. So if you're curious, I invite you to check out a working paper that we've written and published on the Climate Strategies uh, webpage. And we have already done one workshop on this, and we're having a second one in Brussels on March the 2nd. And if anyone is interested in attending, you should come talk to me or Henry over there in the corner. And open up. Great. Thank you very much, Sonia. It's fantastic. So it seems like we're moving from the international and the intergenerational that Daryl introduced to Sam's talk, which is a bit more about the sort of north-south development justice dimensions, how we deal with climate in that context. And then Sonia nicely is bringing out some of the intra-societal trade-offs, ideas around just transition, what do you do about the losers of transitions, how do societies deal with you know, uh, historical injustices uh, in, in the context of moving forward. So lots of different dimensions. Our final speaker now is, is Henry Derwent, who's uh, Head of Climate Strategies, uh, previously Head of International Missions Trading Association. I'm not sure where within that panorama of different takes he's going to pitch his talk, but uh, we'll find out. So Henry, have the floor. Thanks very much. Uh, well, Daryl said that um, his philosophy for dealing with uh, uh, a limited amount of time was to cut the jokes. Um, I'm going to go the opposite way. I'm going to cut the substance. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the gags. Um, <laughs> so the last time that I was in a room in a university with um, people um, interested from an academic perspective in uh, ethics and, and, and justice issues was, was many years ago when I was uh, working in the environmental protection part of um, DEFRA, I think it was then. Um, and uh, we had actually uh, sponsored, the, 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 the department had sponsored a, a, a small uh, working group and indeed a couple of PhD students, I think, my goodness, those were the days, um, <laughs> in Oxford uh, to look at the interface between the um, environmental protection uh, issues of um, political ethics and, and justice um, 
and academic perspectives on, on those issues. And it was great. We had a couple of roundtables. And... Um, uh, but you could see that there was a real divide. Two worlds were sort of looking at each other and just not really getting what it was that was making the other lot tick. Um, and after a particularly circular discussion, uh, at least as um, I saw it, uh, I said, well, look, OK, look, can I just ask a question? I mean, let's get, let's get serious about this. On my desk back at the office, I've got a problem about whether or not we license a particular GMO, right? It's one of the things I had to deal with then for my, for, for, for my sins. Uh, and broadly, the benefits uh, you can see are these, and many of them are sort of absolutely right. Um, I think it was probably one of the golden... Uh, uh, food, food crops. Uh, the disadvantages are, are, are these. Can you tell me how anything that you've been talking about for the last um, three hours is actually going to help me? Uh, and the answer I got immediately from uh, the, um, the, the guy, I think it was from Manchester College, Oxford, was, oh no, that's too hard. So um, that has <laughs> led me... Uh, I think to have a little bit of worry about uh, about where conversations like this go, but um, things have changed, I think, and, and maybe this issue is uh, better developed, uh, and certainly we have lots of perspectives in this room rather than just uh, the two from the from the wings of the whole thing. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, well, I thought, you know, um, blame it on the lack of imagination, but I always like to see what's sort of put in the description of the session. Um, and it was the implementation pathway and uh, key climate ethics questions. Um, and I have to say that negotiators, and I suppose for climate, a, a lot of what I've been doing comes into the category of, uh, well, my perspective is largely uh, domestic policy, but also a negotiator. And, and certainly negotiators don't do ethics. I mean, this, this doesn't often seem to be understood. Um, they do rhetoric, but they don't do ethics. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about, about putting up my own choice of ethics questions. Uh, the ministers that they serve may, if you're lucky, be different. Um, and that's the issue, really. How do they get an ethical perspective to actually join to the... Uh, uh, to the brutal uh, analysis of self-interest that is usually what negotiators are asked to place in front of them, and that's to do with civil society, that's to do with industry, uh, and so on and so forth. We, we ought to talk about that, but perhaps not right now. Um, so the implementation timetable, it's unbelievably fast, as I'll, as I'll show you, but of course, from some perspectives, it's not really fast enough. Um, the key ethics questions, this is my list of ethics-heavy issues that could not the Paris process of court. So others will see it differently. Uh, and the test that I'd, I'd like to apply is which of these candidates could create serious roadblocks on, on the road out from, from Paris. I appreciate that's not really an ethical test, but it's a, it's a pragmatic test, and, and I believe... Uh, there is uh, a quite a, a, a space in the literature and in philosophy generally to, for, for pragmatic ethics. And I'm going to show a slide on each and uh, give you a verdict on the roadblock capacity of, of, of each as, as I see it. Um, on the way, I'll, I'll be providing uh, on the screen anyway an awful lot of questions to think about. And we haven't got time to go into all of them, but I hope that these slides will have some afterlife that they'll be uh, circulated and made available. Um, and, and, and I also have to say that one thing that I would have put in there, uh, but, but haven't, um, is loss and damage. Uh, and the reason I, uh, I didn't do that was that I thought that Sonia was going to cover that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it's, it's justifiable because there isn't actually much about loss and damage. And there's some quite interesting stuff there. Uh, but it's mainly a sort of, you know, watch this space in Warsaw or a Warsaw mechanism. But in terms of roadblock potential, I believe that the loss and damage debate and the pursuit of the Warsaw mechanism is, is, is right up there. Very important indeed. But let's look at the others. Um, oh, well, I couldn't find a font small enough for this one. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this, is, this is just you know, some of the extremely important elements on the implementation uh, pathway. Um, <coughs> Uh, and, and, and these are these could be key for the issues that I've mentioned and m many others as well. But just if you could, if your eyesight's that good, just look at the number there, which has got two and twenty sixteen. You know, in other words, to be presented to M Morocco at the beginning of November. Uh, 
So we've got, um, just for example, the, the, the uh, CMA guidance on the information content of, of, of NDCs. We've got uh, rule on transparency of, of actions. All this is sort of uh, there, and it's great to see it there in the, in, in the Paris Agreement. But what does it mean? And I've heard a number of negotiators say, in respect of a number of these issues, uh, you think that's set down? The negotiations have only started on this and this and this and this. So uh, the trouble is that for the Paris system to work, I believe that almost all of these things actually have to be made to work to get the whole thing uh, going forward in some way that people will regard as ethical, because essentially it means that their issues are being taken care of and progressed at the same time as other people's. Uh, and my verdict here is, is that so many of these issues are, are technically difficult and politically challenging that it will be pretty miraculous to get all this stuff done by 2020, let alone for those for which it's relevant, early November 2016. This isn't so much a roadblock as a traffic jam, um, but the effect could be much the same. And the prospects of people sort of saying we're not getting... We're not getting any further on this because somebody around this table is deliberately slowing it down in order to achieve progress with another, which is a standard accusation between negotiators, and actually it's usually true. Uh, that's, that's very real. So let's go into the chosen uh, ethics uh, I issues. And um, this reflects what Sonia was saying. Have we solved differentiation? And you know, I totally understand where uh, her uh, US um, uh, negotiator colleague was coming from. Because from that perspective, I think that the, uh, the Laurent Fabius and the US um, and everybody else have done a pretty damn good job of taking an issue which has been a real problem for a very long uh, time and I won't say solving it, but reducing its capacity to act as a, as, as a festering wound. Um, uh, and they do that basically by preserving um, the principle, uh, at least the name of the principle, by um, uh, scattering the place with specific exemptions and derogations for parties who need it, but maintaining the point which certainly for the US was absolutely crucial one, that at some point there is something that every country has to do with regard to mitigation. Whether that will all turn out to be worth it if we get a Republican in the White House is, of course, another, uh, another matter. Um, I think uh, my understanding, I don't know what um, uh, uh, Uber and, and, and others think, was that Africa was left feeling pretty disgruntled because so few of the derogations which originally included Africa alongside SIDS um, and LDCs suddenly lost that. and No one quite understood how or why. Um, but my verdict is that, by my chosen test, uh, certainly for the next couple of years or so, this isn't likely to cause a lot of problems going forward. I hope to goodness I'm right. The second, however, is much more worrying for me, and that is the whole principle of voluntarism. And, and of course, well, it has to be said that voluntarism has been tried before and failed before. Uh, convention, look at Article 2B of the Convention. Uh, and it, 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 the same issue comes up here in uh, a new guise. Um, essentially, uh, states have to set out their highest possible ambition and then do better than that. Well, why should I be genuine about my highest possible ambition when I suspect that other people aren't? Or I can see some benefit in my uh, giving essentially a not very honest answer to that. That's just another aspect of the tragedy of the commons, if you'd like to look at it that way, and it hasn't gone away. Um, I'd love to believe Fergus as well. He must be getting a bit worried about the number of people who, <laughs> yeah. who, who, who profess to be his friends and then say, yeah, but your main argument, not so sure. But we can talk about that as well. Um, and my worry is that this, this is the engine of the entire new system. Um, how long is it going to take to achieve broad equality of effort on the basis of people putting forward sneakily dishonest proposals about highest possible and then being found up, out by the Paris system? How long is it going to take to conclude that actually this system doesn't work and we need to amend it again? So my verdict here is that this isn't so much a roadblock as a potentially infinite extension of the journey. Um, it could take a long time to really see that it's happening and even longer to get out of it. The next one is financing. Well, people have mentioned this, and, and, and I won't repeat what's already been said. 
I mean, I have to say from personal experience that um, the provision, particularly of new and additional finance for environmental objectives is, uh, is a story with a, a long history in uh, international negotiations. And it's usually a shell game. Um, your, your, your job as a developed country negotiator is to make it look as though you've found wonderful new resources which you know perfectly well that your finance minister, minister uh, told your environment minister in no uncertain terms on the day before you left was absolutely out of the question. Um, what I have to say is that um, I, I, I congratulate the, uh, the writers of the Paris Agreement for creating a system uh, which mean, means that the shell game is going to get much, much harder. But that is usually going to be a challenge rather than necessary, uh, necessarily uh, an indication that the whole game has to stop. Um, uh, and the, uh, the financing is huge. Um, Sam has already said, you know, 100 billion is not a large number. Um, you can get, you, 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 your eyes can cross to the middle when you look at, for example, on the energy side, the IEA. Uh, analysis of, uh, of, of investment needs. Um, uh, and, and you have to understand that you're talking about the difference between a with carbon and without, or, or higher carbon and low carbon alternatives, which actually that differential doesn't look very large compared with the, whatever it is, I think they last said 48 trillion to 2035 uh, of, of investment that's needed. But the difference is still measured in trillions. Who's going to pay those trillions? How are they going to do it? Why? should the pri private sector get involved in doing that. So my verdict here is that even if um, developing countries accept the transparency reports that come from developed countries in its new version of the game, um, and I, I fear that as the full costs that need to be met become evident, uh, and as we go further and further towards 2020 and even beyond, before we get agreement on the post-2025 numbers to extend 100 billion, this could be explosive. Three minutes. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, so, uh, if I've only got three minutes more, I won't spend long on markets and offsets, uh, which is a shame because it's my special subject, uh, and I still believe that it's really, really important. Um, but although um, the um, perseverance of the negotiators, I think, uh, deserves a great deal of credit, uh, you have to say that it's not the most important issue that's come out. At the end of the day, this means absolutely nothing until there is a, until there is a clear source of demand. And I see no demand at the moment. Um, maybe you could say there should be some. Maybe the, the ground has been spoilt by accusations of low environmental integrity, which have just closed negotiation down on something which really uh, is important. But that's the fact of the matter right now. Not a major issue, not a roadblock. Trade. Well, there's very little about trade. Uh, in fact, the word's not there. Uh, whatever happened to those references to disguised restrictions on trade? Uh, have we come to an agreement now which means that there's no chance of border taxes or other carbon tariffs? I don't think so. Because is highest possible ambition to be defined uh, on a basis with or without protection for your national competitiveness? That's the key point. And at some point, possibly not in the first generation of NDCs, that is going to be tested. And there are a few other issues which can lead to uh, levels of anger uh, that uh, can infect um, discussions between developed and developing countries about this stuff. I, I, I know food miles was one of the things that I had to deal with when I was in, uh, in, in, in EFRA. So my verdict here is that this is, if you like, a dark horse roadblock. There's a wonderful mixture of metaphors. Uh, <laughs> if, if developed countries do press ahead strongly, but it could take some years to do so. And my final uh, gloomy and overarching point is, is this one. Um, obviously, it, it all depends on your interpretation of words like reasonable, acceptable, and expectations in that first bullet there. Um, but you could start doing some calculations. I'm surprised that more haven't been done. Uh, but maybe people, if you look at the penultimate bullet, uh, are slightly worried that you really don't want to know the answer here. Um, because, of course, we should be uh, starting uh, from the sustainable development uh, goals <coughs> and from the equality goals that Uber and others have mentioned. 
But the trouble is, the Earth is telling us we do not have time uh, to do this if it's going to take us a heck of a long time. And at the end of the day, we all lose, and the developing countries lose even more. Um, and I really worry that given how much time we have lost, um, uh, and, and, and given how the priority for economic development is, is a given for everybody, developed countries included, um, uh, and how little sort of wartime mentality there is yet in rich countries, there's a real problem. Uh, I, I remember in particular a point where uh, a, uh, a minister who I won't name um, expostulated during one of my um, policy briefings about, uh, about aviation. Uh, blimey, I'm not going to mess with people's holidays in Spain. So that's a, another joke, if you like. So my verdict here is this isn't a roadblock on its own, but it's a reason why highest possible ambition may meet social barriers before it meets technical ones. And the final one is intergenerational equity. Darrell has mentioned that all, all, already. I rather wish that that was a potential roadblock. As the generations roll over uh, and the system was taking too long, then you could sort of say that it would become more and more important. But even at present, I have to say that my, perspective, my, my perception is that the time discount rate still seems to be just too high, even among the young. And that isn't a joke at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great, well thanks to all our speakers for an excellent set of interventions. Um, we've got at least 45 minutes, we started 10 or 15 minutes later, so we might be able to slightly into the lunch break, uh, if need be. Before we take the first round of questions, can I ask that the windows be open a bit so we just get a breath of uh, fresh air in the room. Can I ask the other panellists to come up to the front so we can, uh, and then I'll start collecting questions. So we'll do these in rounds. So, um, mine isn't a question, it's an, it's an offer to everybody in the room. So, um, in 2014, our foundation asked the question, can you equitably and whilst protecting human rights do the aggressive mitigation action needed to achieve zero carbon emissions by 2050? Uh, that report answers so uh, answers from one perspective, you know, it's one report, it's, it's um, in the authors are Stephen Carter and Paul Baer, but it, asks, it tries to answer so many of the questions that I, I heard so many of you ask, and I, I'll, I'll send it perhaps to you, Katrina, maybe you can circulate it to everybody. I recommend it as a, as a read. It's the science then to, to you, but that it's based on is obviously IPCC science. It looks at the fact that to achieve 1.5 1, 1 degrees rather than 2 is the same actions, just faster. And obviously there is a huge political reality around that, can you? But it is the same things, just no more messing around. It's, it's like getting on with them right now. And what we found in that report is that the, the human rights risks of not taking that type of aggressive climate action are greater than the human rights risks of not doing it and dealing with the climate impacts. Mm. So it's like another version of the, the economics almost. So it, 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 there is less human rights risk mm. um, in, in taking this action. But you must remember then in designing every single climate action and strategy that you put human rights obligations first. So that you design all of your policies at the national level in whatever country to proactively think about what the impacts are on people's people's rights, on, on equality, on poverty, right across uh, you know right across all of the sectors. So um, that I, th I think it might help, and just you know, so many of the things you were asking were things we questions we asked in this report, um, and so I'll make sure it gets shared. Okay, thanks. We'll take two more questions in this round. I'll give you a chance to come back. Yeah, Fergus, and then Aaron. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm actually, I'm glad Tara went first because I think that sort of speaks to some of what I was going to say. I mean, it, it, I think it's, it's, it's an important point that you and I actually see this very similarly and actually agree, which I think should probably alleviate some of the concerns, at least around side effects of mitigation, because it can be done in ways where we can deal radically with all of these, all of these problems. Can be, it's a crucial can, point. Yeah. But what, what I, um, but what I wanted to say, I think, um, I mean, a really interesting set, set of presentations. Um, I'm quite humbled that you all mentioned mine, all three of you mentioned, mentioned I mine. Need to, but, I need to hear your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but I think I want to sort of emphasize, and I know you guys know this, but for the benefit of all of the audience, this is not me sort of, you know, one Sunday afternoon doing some back of the envelope calculations. All I really did was synthesize and put in a coherent framework a bunch of very rigorous and systematic work that's been done by some very serious um, people and organizations 
and actually quite conservative serious people in organisations, mostly over the last two years, um, where I've sort of been fortunate to be exposed to the cutting edge of what, what's going on here. So, so I, I sort of don't want you to think that it's sort of a marginal view or it's just me. I mean, sort of people who believe that view of the world are like Nick Stern, the International Energy Agency's modelling, and the heads of the OECD, the IMF, and the World Bank. So I just want to sort of point that out. Um, two specific comments. One um, to Daryl on, on ratcheting up. And I mean, general, in general, I, th I think you're quite right to be sceptical and, and worried about a lot of things in the, in the text. But on ratcheting up, I think one way to look at it is why do we even have the INDCs that we have now if we were in a sort of the, the collective action problem were true, we, we would be surprised to see any mitigation happening. And I think we need to sort of understand why what has happened has happened as a key to thinking about how we can build on that and accelerate that in, in the future. And I think about it in terms of sort of the dynamics of a range of different things around innovation, finance, lobbying, you know, sort of the political economy, social norm change, institutional change. And if you think about sort of the drop in renewable energy prices. It started with feed-in tariffs in Denmark and Germany, increased markets, increased investment, Chinese manufacturing came along, lowered costs further. And now, again, to take an Australian example, you now you have one in four Australian households with solar PV panels. Um, the industry employs more people than the mining industry. Uh, you have political lobbying counterweights, which leads to more policies. So there are all of these complex dynamics carrying things forward many of which do require new policies, but some of which don't. And I think it's that logic that is likely to lead countries to be able to be confident in ratching up, which is not to say we should just sit back and watch it all happen by, by any means, but there are dynamics that we can push further and as well as barriers that we need to worry about. And then just quickly to Sonia on the distribution of benefits, while I completely agree we need to be concerned with that, I think there are, there are some that sort of come, come naturally, and I think one really big one is like air pollution, right? you know, kills seven million people a year, the World Health Organization and the, the, the UCL Lancet Commission said that tackling climate change is the biggest health opportunity of the 21st century because the people who are dying from air pollution are not rich people. You know, in China, where 4,000 people die a day from air pollution, the leaders in Zhong Nanhai in, in the compound have, you know, perfectly purified air systems. Um, but if you're, you know, homeless, then you're breathing that stuff 24 hours a day. Um, so there's this huge potential gains that in, in some of these areas that, that don't necessarily require additional redistributive measures. And even things like fossil fuel subsidies, tend, removing those tends to, to benefit the poor. But, but there's complexities. With some but complexities about how you do it. With some complexities. Yeah. But, but <laughs> They're really we, careful. We should sort of automatically assume that <laughs> dealing with all of these problems will also require additional redistribution, and really some of them will. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Aaron, briefly if you can. And yeah, then we'll briefly. Get a so one of the things that I find kind of striking with this discussion we're having is that it, we have one perspective that looks at the Paris Agreement as being a, a real success. We see this real activity from all different sectors, a diplomatic success. And I think that that is true, and I, I fully buy that picture. And then there's another story that says this pathetically inadequate. And that's also true. And that seems to me to be the, the, the real worrying aspect of it. And so, uh, and, I, and I'm thinking that it's not just that our climate institutions are insufficient, but there's a worry that because of the short amount of time that we're reaching the limit of our existing political and economic institutions. And Sonia, you were saying, well, we, we need to start focusing on the justice of implementation. So if I'm a political philosopher, someone who's focused on justice, what kind of, I mean, what kind of things, if, if, if that's the worry, if that's the, if this gap between our capacity <coughs> and our, uh, uh, our ambitions, we have the ambition, but we just don't have the capacity, what should we be looking at? What kind of institutional reforms are we talking about uh, to get this massive change you're talking about? Okay, Sonia, do you want to come straight back on that? I can, or we can, were those all questions, or do we want to collect <coughs> a few more? I can go. So that was mine. Mine was a comment. Yours is a comment. Offer a comment and a question. So you respond to that question and take the question. So I guess for me, there, this is I mean, this is exactly the this is a question. So there's two things. One, the institutions we should look, be looking at, I think, are interesting. So there's the actual where policies are happening are happening in specific organizations or specific departments even. 
So if you think about transportation policies, this is an off area and off that does, does not get a lot of e examination from a justice perspective. But those are whole departments who are trying to figure out how do we transform whole energy structures. The institutions already exist. They're already ministries. There's local authorities who are dealing with this, but they don't often have the kind of examination about how, how do we do this kind of planning. So I'm, what I'm, where I'm thinking, and maybe this is a very narrow way of thinking about it, is thinking about all the organizations that are already carrying out a full suite of development goals, where the added activity would be if we really wanted to meet these kinds of ambitious things. Because when you start looking at, say, any country's INDC, and then you say, okay, what would this really look like in the country? You realize very quickly it cuts across pretty much every institution and ministry they have in that country. And many of them have just been kind of overlooked. They're often really boring. It's how do you do local accounting? It's how do you deal with often some of the, I mean, urban planning becomes crucial. And these are areas where a lot of the political philosophy I don't see engaging in the messiness of these sub-domestic institutions on the ground. How do we make it work? And what are some of the implications of very boring choices? So for instance, one of the pieces of analysis I did is I was interested in how justice was being framed in the analysis of a particular cap and trade system. To do that, I went through and read every single economic model they had used and asked, in this particular sub-level bureaucratic economic model that was com commissioned by a mid-level bureaucrat, whose interests got represented and how? And you quickly saw who got left out and who was covered in that. And that's how you get to the meat of whose human rights are going to be impacted when you get into the real nitty gritty, which documents are being used, which kinds of analysis are being used, which kinds of advice, who's advising, how is it being framed. And so that's kind of the level where I'm thinking. So it's not really new institutions, it's existing implementing institutions. But maybe I'm being really narrow about it. There could be other ones that I haven't thought about because I'm not really an institutional person. But that's kind of where I've landed as I've thought about this. Great, thanks a lot. Let's take any uh, Dominic, I think you had your hand up first, uh, and then <coughs> a question at the back. And a question at the back. And then, uh, yeah, Dominic. It has to do with the um, point that Sonia made, and actually quite a, some other people made, that you know, we should really all focus on justice in the implementation, just what you were speaking about. Also, not only developing countries, but also developed countries. Now, I'm full, I fully agree that we should get into the messy details and be able to give answers about GMO specific crops, etc., all that. But I, I actually have a worry um, which has the implication that I don't think it's good to call for more focus on justice and implementation. So what does this, this mean? For example, if we implement cap and trade, yes, poor people will have to pay um, in often and rich countries. So that's a justice issue. Or we install kind of a solar plant in a developing country. It displaces people. Human rights are violated. So these are questions of justice and human rights that come up in implementation. And my worry is that, <coughs> that there's kind of a trade-off. So generally, we're doing much too little mitigation, which is a huge justice issue. Human rights will be violated on a huge scale. And that if we focus on these frictions to use, <laughs> uh, yeah, to use an euphemism on these frictions in implementation, it will be a break on implementing more mitigation, and that there's much more at stake if we slow down the mitigation. Also, um, the justice issues in implementation shall be quick. They have to benefit the bias, so they're visible. Often they're sins of commission rather than sins of omission. And they, they get noticed by the rich people and so on. So they already have the bias of being noticed more than the justice issue and doing little about mitigation. So I'm worried about telling people, yes, focus more on justice and implementation. OK. I'll take two or three more very brief interventions, please, so we can get maximum uh, inputs. Yeah. So I just had a comment on the 1.5. Sorry. Oh, sorry. 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 Yeah. Proceed with justice. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> well, one of the major ethical, moral, political issues related to <coughs> climate change is effects on migration patterns and the prospects of climate refugees, particularly across international borders. I was wondering if the panel could reflect a bit on what came out of Paris what the implications of the Paris Agreements are in relation to this, this topic of issue. Okay, and now you. <laughs> so, um, so I had a comment on the 1.5 and then I thought about benefit sharing. So the comment on the 1.5 is just, isn't the virtue of the 1.5 just that the higher we aim, or, or the lower we aim as it were, the more likely we are to hit some, some less sort of 
I highly <laughs> believe in target, as in, you know, the 1.5 isn't there because anyone thinks we'll, we'll hit that. If the 1.5 is there, because if you aim for that, the chances of you hitting something sort of less egregious is, is, is sort of it, it, it heightened. So that was just a thought on why the 1.5 <coughs> might still be useful, even if it's not very good uh, in, in other ways. Um, and then in terms of, so you uh, said something about, um, everyone's talking about the benefits uh, of mitigation, but you need to think about how to share those. And that, that's obviously right, but it's also just as a tension, right? So the, the, the excitement of Fergus's presentation is, look at these benefits that we can sell to the individual countries to say, you know, if you actually sort of get going with this, you get to keep all these goodies, and so it's good for you. That's the sort of excitement of it. And then, but then if we want to start talking about, and now we want to tell you how you've got to share those with everybody else, there's just a bit of a tension there. That, that's more of an observation than a question, but it's nice to think that, you know, Ferguson's work is exciting and that we can then talk about benefit sharing, but there's a tension there because the excitement of Ferguson's work is precisely to say to countries, well, look, you can keep this stuff if you, if you get going on this. So that's just a, okay. a worry about focusing on benefit sharing. Okay. Got a few more names on the list, but in the interest of gender balance, I'm going to go to you, Mead, first, and then we'll do another round. Yeah. Okay, so just two questions. Um, I think that on the, the question of response measures and um, adverse effects of any aggressive um, mitigations, you know, has been as heavily collected uh, part of the response measure kind of debate, which can still be explosive. But in the room in Paris, one of the way out, and also to deal with the Saudis, especially, who are leading on this, were to, to, have, to use a transparency framework to do that. I think one of the first things is to, to actually get data in, and, and get all countries to see, okay, you're doing this, are you doing also analysis to see whether there are going to be any, any, any consequences. And that's a, a path. Um, and, and some things that where we could use this response framework to try to build this kind of trust and learn from experience. And also, this is uh, this is a, a capacity building exercise. This response framework in itself, with even the, the the verification framework to share best, best practice. And I think getting that space uh, in the implementation framework, learning from Paris, is going to be really important. And then for Henry, uh, having been his. Uh, I was working with you actually in Bali, in the, in the, I was back in office doing the local function. Uh, and um, also during that time, we had set up the, the Climate Change Committee. And Yuba has questioned previously about you know, how to, to move, do we have the right institutional reform? And one of my questions was whether we should uh, push for having an equivalent of the Climate Change Committee which provides this kind of independent uh, analysis of countries on their their action, their policies, uh, to do this kind of almost free advice to, to say to the government, oh, this is what you can do, you can achieve more. This is, and, and, and not just on mitigation, the climate change committee also do work on, on, on adaptation. Whether this kind of institutions can be a model for, you know, at, in a, can, could be scaled up, basically. And, and to support the uh, inaction of law you know, in each country. So this kind of uh, institution plus the uh, inaction of law and, and using the, this kind of framework to do that could be a good model to, 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 to push implementation. Great. Good set of questions. Uh, let's go around to Daryl. There's a couple that were targeted to you, I think. Do you want to start um, with them? I, I think it was just the one about 1.5 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. So they targeted towards me. Is that right? Um, if, so if that's right, I mean, I mean, what you say, of course, makes sense at a certain level of abstraction, I think. But the question is, I, I think um, you talk about, you know, if we set this as a goal, then we pursue it, and maybe we won't reach it, but we'll reach something that is good, right? But I think we have to ask ourselves the question about the means, right? The means that we use to pursue the goal. And are the means mitigation? Is mitigation sufficient? And if, if, if we're just pursuing mitigation, what, are, what will the effects of mitigation be on developing countries if we pursue a goal that's even, <coughs> even more stringent than two degrees? Is this, is this going to have negative development effects on countries by raising the absolute cost of energy, for example? If mitigation alone isn't sufficient, we have to turn to other means. Are other means even available, right? So do we have, would we have the technology for carbon capture and storage that would make this possible? Is it reasonable to believe that we would have it? Would we want to use it if we had it? 
do we want to pursue um, investigations and research into solar radiation management in order to help us use these goals? So it seems to me it's, it's sort of strange, I think, to adopt a goal like this without thinking about whether or not the, the, the means that we would want to use, the means that we would have to use in order to pursue that goal are means that we'd want to use. And so I, I guess I'm just, I, it's just a plea to think about the means. I don't know. Once, once we thought about the means, whether or not we'd still want to adopt that goal or not, but it seems odd to me to think that you just ad adopt the goal in the absence of the consideration of the means. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, the goal is fairly vague on 1.5 degrees, so I think I agree with your comment. It's an aspirational goal. In the UK, <coughs> there's a currently a, uh, there's a conversation in Parliament about a, adjusting uh, existing child poverty targets. Um, so, they, you know, they're not going to be achieved, so Parliament's debating about adjusting them. Um, so the point was they've been aspirational to tr tackle child poverty and, and so you can either argue that that has failed and that it was wrong in the first place or it's driven action on child poverty. And I would, I would say it's one of the reasons why there's success in Paris that 1.5 was firmly on the table. Um, but it is, you know, if, if possible, it says basically, I can't remember the exact word. So, so, so we shouldn't make too much about, about that. And the whole point about the glass half full or half empty is the INDCs are the starting point. You know, Paris was the start of the journey, not the end of the journey. And of course, that's politically quite hard um, because a lot of political capital's already been put into getting so many heads of state there. Um, so I think it's building the narrative in the institutions. And, and if you think about it, it's for most institutions, they're just starting this journey. You know, if you start in the city of London, they're in a, all corporates. There's only a, a fraction of the sector that gets this. There's a whole part of sector and society that doesn't get it. So the journey is huge, and that's the case whether you're looking at sectors in Africa or at a sub-national level in Latin America. I completely agree with Sonia, was just referring to this. In, in, I think taking NDCs to sub-national level in, in a Latin American context is critical because that's where the equity, justice and governance issues sit and that's already happening in, in countries like in countries like Peru and Colombia. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks, Henry. Um, so I'll, I'll pick and choose a little uh, from um, a fascinating set of, of questions and a fascinating set of, uh, uh, of doors um, for debate that, that, that open up. Um, on what Fergus said, it, it's an absolutely fair question to say, well, if there isn't any economic benefit from doing this stuff, how come we've managed to get this far and we still seem to be going in the right direction? Um, uh, but I think the answer to that is that it's, uh, it's an equilibrium, which is not an e economic equilibrium. Um, I think the issue <coughs> is essentially uh, how far... <coughs> From the pers from a political perspective, um, are, is 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 the power uh, of the climate change argument and the development argument and future of humanity argument actually worth at any one time, compared with the brute fact that these are externalities, so you don't have to pay them. So if you're asking me to pay them, you're asking me to pay a price. Um, and it is the job, certainly I regard it as, 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 as my job now, and I hope did in, 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 in the past as well, and I hope many people feel, feel the same, to try to increase the power of that first set of factors in the equilibrium calculation in order that they overcome more and more of the, of, of the latter. Um, as for co-benefits, I mean, you and I have talked about this before. I mean, it's great where you can do it, but you too do tend to be deflated, as, as I often find, when a power station manager sort of says, do you know how much more energy I have to, I have to um, uh, expend in order to strip out another layer of particulate matter from my emissions? Um, you know, it, this is a trade-off. Sort it out. Um, the, the, the second area that I'd like to com comment is, is linked to that. And that's Dominic's point about the necessity of trade trade off. Okay, so we've managed to get away with talking about just transition and hoping that that'll see us through some really, really unpleasant discussions with, you know, miners. Well, it hasn't worked so far for Polish miners, uh, though actually there's, they're, they're diminishing, but probably not nearly f fast enough at the moment. This is this hurts people. We are talking about a massive economic change, which from which very large numbers of people cannot be protected. Uh, and it's really hard to make sure that the people who both most need the protection actually get it. Same problem with social policy all, 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 all over the place. Um, 
and, and that's what politicians are for. They are to sort of work out where the trade-offs are possible and how much they will get support if they go go to the point where they can sort of say to somebody, look, I'm awfully sorry, but you've lost, so let's do what we can to make sure that that losing process is, is not as damaging as it might otherwise be. And during that process, I fear most of those politicians are not Kantians, um, and neither are their voters, actually. Uh, they, uh, they, want the, they want the ends. As for the means, somebody else sort that out. And that's usually politicians who would really rather not, but they've got to. And then finally... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a point about the Climate Change uh, Committee. Whoa, huge issue. And, and I think, actually, the Paris Agreement has gone a long, long way. We must see what Substra and SBI actually come up with. But they could create, um, uh, doubtless to the horror uh, of, of the fulfilment of the worst nightmares of the Republican Party in the US, uh, something which is akin to a compliance committee uh, with even if the words non-adversarial, non-punitive, and so on and so forth are repeated again and again and again, ultimately you're saying, hmm, this is a really interesting plan you're putting forward, country S. I really think you could, if you did it this way, do it slightly better. We have enough difficulty in the European Union, certainly in this country, when somebody in Brussels says that to us. Um, so it's, 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 it's really hard. But there's another way of doing it, which is say, saying we should be facilitating the creation of climate change committees as a institutional mechanism at national level. The boot is on the national foot at the moment. NDCs are the other, other, other places where countries have to step up to the mark. And uh, at least you could expect them to get as far as they possibly could if you've got somebody who is um, facilitated, so capacity building, um, to be able to sort of say, well, look, you know, we're not getting enough cooperation here from the agriculture ministry because there is this, that, and the other that could be done. And that, to a degree, is what the Climate Change Committee managed to do, still manages to do, despite the Treasury's best efforts in the UK. So I, I would think, I mean, you know, I, I have an interest here. We, we've actually got a climate strategies project on this, which we're developing. Uh, but I think it's a really, really interesting thing to pursue. I, I didn't respond to Fergus, but I don't know if I can or not now. Could you capture it in the next round? Because I just want to give Sonia a moment, and then we'll try and take another round of questions. So Sonia, I'm just going to take the ones that didn't get picked up. Um, yours seemed like more of a comment about response measures, Yamid. And I've, I had actually been wondering how that happened in the negotiations, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to leave that there. Um, the displacement question, I, I mean, the way it's displacement is listed as a potential issue for the was Warsaw Lock and Loss and Damage Mechanism to discuss, as it, it's standing there. There's, as far as I know in that, it's, no one quite knows what that would look like. Um, it's going to be an ongoing conversation. How it's going to be fit in, we don't know. Um, it, it's one of those issues that's been lingering for a long time in the conversation, but nothing, as far as I know, people who are in the room might have better sense, but it's one of those things that it's kind of a placeholder for, we know we have to talk about this at some point, but it certainly wasn't something we talked about it now. But for a get from an equity issue, there's a million and one questions here um, from both theoretical and practical questions. Everything like how you do it, how you should pay for it, what does that mean for legal definitions of refugees in various domestic countries? What does it mean for different kinds of support? How you calculate different kinds of support? There's a, a zillion questions that are going to have to be addressed at some point. But for the time being, it seems like it's kind of important. But we haven't got there yet. It, it's my reading. People who are experts may have better insight. OK, thanks. So if people are ask very short questions, we can do another, uh, another round. The gentleman in the back has been waiting for a long time. So you first, and then uh, the guy here will do the yeah. yeah, okay. my, my comments on the um, and I mean, we talked a lot about policy responses. Well, I just wonder whether we also need to take account of the, the background um, context of the economy in general and, and the impact that has on our ability to take this forward. Because you know, there's no doubt that the UK in particular and Europe in general might argue has reached their targets because of uh, um, the, the recession. Of and obviously, so, so the state of the global economy going forward is, is going to be an important consideration. I just wonder whether the panel have any views on that. And the other background context is obviously the price of oil and gas to make, which is obviously reduced massively. Um, and, and again, I wonder what the implications of the panel thinks that has in terms of the, the policy response to 
I mean, that, there, there are two possible elements of that. Medium term means that more of the stuff's likely to stay on the ground, which is a good thing. But in the short term, oil and gas prices means that energy uses it to go up. So I just wonder whether people have thought about that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah my question is for um, Gavin. Unfortunately, I missed the um, opening session this morning on sustainable development. This always seems to me that there's that the obvious tension in the concept of sustainable development is that sustainability goes one way and development goes the other way. So, the question is two parts. What exactly do you mean by sustainable development? And does it survive as a framing if, as you raise the prospect, the growth people are right in some sense? If the what? Degrowth. And I'd also like to say, I would love to agree with Fergus as well, <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> and the reason I don't is that if you read those reports, I don't think you'll find any credible ground of thinking about the energy supply and the renewables. Okay, Simon. Yeah, I have a question that relates to the interchange between uh, Barrow and Patrick. Uh, we'll say more about it this afternoon, but um, the thought is just this. When you have a target, it's important to think about the political role that it, it plays. And I think that's different from the target you might have as a country or as a corporation. It has a political role. And I think there's three things that happen when you, you say something that is a political role. One is you have to think about the uh, aspirational dimension. The second is you have to think about the credibility of the one. And so if someone says, well, our target is you know, one degree, People are just going to laugh. In fact, people did. Some people did have a similar reaction to one quite high. Mm -hmm. So, on the one way, you want to be aspirational. On the other, you don't want to lose any credibility. And the third thing, which I think relates to what Dal was saying, is you have to have an abuse or misuse kind of thing. So, some people are very worried about negative emissions technology. Says, so well, now you put that 1.5 in, that's going to be exploited by people who want to go down the negative emissions technology, and we're worried about that or the geoengineering type things. So, I think those are the three ingredients that, that need to go in there. So it doesn't deny what Patrick says. Uh, it just sort of says, well, um, here are the three factors that you have to, to balance out. And I guess you're worried about the abuse one to some extent. Is that right? OK, one final question over there at the back. Um, so I'm just wondering if um, people could say something about the trade-off, the problems which are going to be created for states in meeting their own contribution which are caused by the ways in which certain kinds of climate change outcomes are already going to happen. So, presumably there are ways in which climate change is really baked in is going to kind of stress states' capacities to act in certain kinds of ways. And I'd just like to be helpful for me if someone can say something about how, what they think those stresses are going to be and how what Okay, thanks. So we'll go around the panel again. Should we go back the other way this time, Sonia? Are you? I don't have that much to offer no? to those things, okay. really. I have side thoughts, but okay. other people are more experts okay. in all well, of them. Okay, well, if you want to come so. back at the end, let me know. So this is uh, Henry. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to pick up the first question, because I think it is humbling and terrifying uh, to see just how much... Um, uh, we and all representatives of those who want the public sector to do stuff um, are uh, liable to be thrown totally off course by changes in the broader economy. Um, you probably, most of you remember who it was uh, who said you can't buck the market. Um, unfortunately, um, it's a very, very good principle. Uh, and Yesterday, I was um, in Vienna uh, at, uh, dealing with some renewable energy uh, issues, looking back at, at, at the success of the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Partnership over the past year. Uh, and one of our prize sets of uh, initiatives uh, was a group of projects in Thailand um, which uh, offer renewable energy sources from the gasification of rice husks to power rice mills there. Um, and we created a financial structure on top of that, and it was all falling apart. And why is it falling apart? Because diesel's become really cheap again. 
And anybody who uses that has a competitive advantage against the people we're supporting, despite the fact the support is, is beyond the market. And another thing, um, a, a number of other uh, neighbours and neighbouring countries have suddenly worked out there's a market for old rice husks. So uh, rather than just giving it away, they force us to pay for it. So economics has this way of actually sort of really getting in the way when you think you're just sort of trying to tip it. Um, uh, and the, uh, the when the Saudis um, decided that they wanted to squeeze uh, U.S. shale producers out of the market, I wonder if even they worked out what that was going to do to um, uh, renewable energy initiatives that, on the face of it, they support. Indeed, some of their money is behind it, uh, in certain cases, uh, across the world. That's what we have to deal with, unfortunately. We just have to... We've got a price of... Uh, of, of a carbon in the EU at the moment, which is down to six, uh, once again as a result, essentially, of gas and oil becoming much, much cheaper, and so nobody actually needs the credits uh, for, the burn for the burning of, of high-carbon fuels. Um, you've just got to make the price... Eventually, you've got to make the prices harder and higher before people start sort of saying, yes, this, is, this stacks up, even against conventional economic factors. Henry, can I just add, yep. add to that quickly? So the other side of that, though, is if you're an oil and gas producer. So, for instance, in some of the heavy producing jurisdictions in North America, we're seeing conversations that have never happened before. Alaska, of all places, is starting to talk seriously about actually taxing local gasoline and consumption and diesel consumption. This has never happened before in Alaska. It's always, there's, it's all, like, because all of their revenue is coming directly from oil and gas sales and now they can't get enough revenue and they're having to change their financial structure in the entire state. Same thing in um, Alberta and Canada. It's fundamentally questioning and allowed a political economy questioning of a, of a jurisdiction which always said we, will own, we, we produce oil and gas. We produce tar sand oil and gas. That is what we do. And all of a sudden, there's been a political pushback. For those of you who don't know, they had a massive political coup in Alberta where the Conservative government, who's been in power for 43 years, went out to the most farthest left-leaning party in the entire country. So it's interesting that these big shifts can actually do really disruptive things in ways you wouldn't expect. And so, yeah, it's, it's having some real challenges for the renewable energies, but it's also changing conversations in producer economies in developed countries in some really creative ways, which I think we also have to bring into this conversation as important. And how do you, how do you then use that momentum to get other kinds of changes in those sorts of jurisdictions? So, so. so, I mean, it's, it's, it's all nationally determined. That's the sort of headline here. And there are loads of unknowns, including political change and, and economic direction, but also climate direction, to go to your point. And the knowledge gaps are really huge, in particular in Africa. Um, you know, sort of that was the purpose. You know, the sort of stern reports just look at the aggregate. And the purpose of this Uganda study, study was to illustrate that, you know, Uganda desperately needs some kind of data to look at what high emissions and low emissions scenarios, how that will play out in their economic growth. And, you know, the, the people just d don't know is, is the simple answer. And so there's an, a giant appetite for looking at climate models at, 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 at the smaller scale in Africa. One of our most successful programs is exactly trying to do this in partnership with NERC. So um, knowledge gap, which links to Yamid's point about capacity gap, is, is, is really important to, to try and factor this into whether ratchets and things will, will be achievable. Thanks. Okay, so um, just quickly on Fergus from two rounds ago, I never properly responded yeah. to you. So I don't, you know, I don't really want to get into an argument with you about whether or not there are collective action problems. As I said before, I hope, I hope Team Stern is right about this. Um, but I, I do think it's consistent with the existence of, of collective action problems that there could be limited progress with respect to mitigation. Right? It's just that the costs haven't, we haven't begun to experience the costs. You can, you can mitigate up to a certain point and then there are costs and then that's when the, the whole thing just begins to fall apart. Or it could be that people make commitments like we've seen, but they don't really ever intend on following through on those commitments, right? I mean, that's also a, a possibility and so it'd be interesting to see. But as I said, you know, everything would be a lot better if the stern analysis is, is the right one. So um, my hope is there. Um, about sustainable development and um, and degrowth. So I mean, I I have a you know a peculiar view about what sustainable development is, or what the right to sustainable development is. I suppose. I mean, I take it to be a liberty claim that states have as states to pursue macroeconomic policies <coughs> that, that allow them to uh, raise the state's 
um, level on the human development index. So states should states have the liberty to do this. Um, uh, I think uh, under that right. Now you ask. I mean, you you should ask. Somebody will ask. Well, what's sustainable about that, right? And it's only sustainable in in a larger framework in which um, the energy policy of states around the country are committed to. Um, engaging in the right kinds of offsets to allow states to do that, either by, either by um, uh, sending their emissions uh, so low that you can tolerate some short-term emissions in, in, in developing states, or by transferring the appropriate technology and resources to allow for, um, for uh, sustainable or development in these countries that's um, on the basis of renewable energies, particularly if those are more expensive. Um, if the Team Stern view is wrong, then that becomes uh, a positive obligation on the parts of, of developing countries. I think it's incredibly demoralizing um, if it's the case that degrowth is required um, in industrialized countries in order to hit um, something like a 2 degree or 1.5 degree um, um, target. I profoundly hope, so I hope, I hope Team Stern is right, I profoundly hope that that view is wrong, but I don't know whether it's wrong. Why, why is it incredibly demoralizing? Well, it's incredibly demoralizing politically because, I mean, just imagine a political party in an industrialized country saying, vote for us and your children will be worse off uh, uh, than, than you are. I mean, a profound series of, of recessions is going to be very hard to, um, to pass, I think, in any industrialized country. Uh, but more than that, I think um, what we know from economic experience and the way in which the world is integrated is that if you have recessionary experiences in developed countries, they don't stay there. They get transmitted to the developing world. So it's going to result in profound economic hardship also in the developing world. So then I think we're at a point where we have to ask ourselves either do we, do we not want to hit that temperature target? Do we want to raise the target because hitting the target is so profoundly destructive on the economies of the developing world? Or do we want to use geoengineering to hit the target? I think that's the position we would be in if, if, the, um, if the degrowth scenarios were correct. So I hope they're not correct. Um, Simon, I mean, that's, that's that's a very interesting way to think about it in the terms of the uh, in terms of the three sort of roles that a goal plays, and I, I like what you say. I would just say that my worry isn't quite about abuse and misuse, although it's it's something like that. I mean, to say abuse and misuse is is already sort of prejudice prejudice the game um, such that we would think that using carbon carbon. Uh, dioxide removal or, or solar radiation management would be a bad thing to do. And I, I just don't know whether it would be a bad thing to do. What I think is uh, important to see is that once you begin taking steps towards a certain goal, you do begin to license, as you said, or as I think you were implying, you do begin to license or you allow entering into the conversation people who will make these claims that the only way to hit that goal is to use that kind of technology. And I think we should think about that before we adopt that, um, that goal as the appropriate goal. Great. I realized I forgot to respond to a question. OK. Can I do it? you, you got to okay. one minute left. Dominic, I'm really sorry. I forgot to answer your question at the very beginning. Um, you had asked if we should, should we really be paying attention to justice when we need so much more implementation? And what are the downsides of this? And I think in. On one hand, I, I think I see where you're coming from, for sure. For instance, you know, when I, when in um, the carbon pricing in British Columbia, it was almost derailed because of a very small group of pretty privileged individuals who felt that it was unfair to them. On the other hand, not listening to them and then not figuring out how to deal with their concerns, that would have derailed the carbon pricing. By listening to them and taking them seriously and figuring out what it was they were really concerned about, they were able to be considered. This is a political process. And I think you can't necessarily just run over someone and say, well, I'm sorry, your justice claims aren't really very good. We're going to completely ignore them. And I'm sorry, you happen to be the most powerful people in the state. And that means we can't have a carbon pricing. Like, there's a certain political, and I, maybe it's distasteful. But yes, sometimes you have to deal with people who are very, very powerful. And their perceptions of justice may not align with our own. But they're also the ones who can completely derail climate policies. On the other flip side, the other argument of, well, climate policy is so important that we can overlook justice is exactly where we get into danger with human rights and, human and, and sustainable development. Because this is the argument that especially you see people being so scared of, that climate, you know, we have to do everything in our power to get such strong carbon prices that we're going to end up having serious, serious development implications or, or justice implications. And I think that's why we have to have these conversations. And they don't always add up. So, it would be very convenient if justice scaled perfectly at all scales across all jurisdictions. But the reality, 
is it's difficult. We can't balance the justice claims of that really, really wealthy person who's going to stop climate policy and their perceptions of justice and the justice claims of someone who's going to be, human rights are going to be impacted. From a pr principles perspective, we can see those as totally different. From a political perspective, it's really hard. And so that's, they, they don't jive perfectly. And I, I'm aware of that. But if you want to get stuff done politically, you, you have to come to some uncomfortable places here sometimes. <laughs> Those are just my thoughts. And talking of comfort, it's time for lunch, I think. <laughs> We've run out of time, but firstly, let me thank all of you for an excellent set of comments and questions. And please join me in thanking the, uh, the panelists. <laughs>